World Heritage Site, Bukhara. Wild equestrian games. Vanished empires. Hospitable people who are proud of their magnificent culture. Here, on the Silk Road in Uzbekistan. This young state is home to 30 million people. The former Soviet Republic borders on Kazakhstan to the north and Afghanistan to the south. Our journey begins in Samarkand and will take us to Boysun, Termez, Shari Sabs, to the capital, Tashkent, and then from Bukhara to Kiva along the old trading route. Samarkand is 2,700 years old. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. Ashur Eshpulatov is on his way to work. The 61-year-old runs a souvenir shop in the courtyard of one of the three old Quran schools. I'm a German specialist and a historian. I learned German in middle school. During the Soviet era, I was at Samarkand University for five years. I taught German studies at the State University, but I've been retired for three years now. And that's why I run this souvenir shop. Ashur proudly takes us into his shop. In a room where students once lived and studied the Quran, Ashur now sells souvenirs to supplement his pension. For decades, the Quran schools, known as madrasas, fell into ruin. These three madrasas here on the famous Registan Square were active until 1925-28. Under Soviet rule, according to a decree by Lenin, all these madrasas were closed. Before the restoration works, the buildings were in serious disrepair. A lot of the tiles had fallen off. It took a lot of money to restore these madrasas. That's all funded by the state. And we pay rent for this shop. And then we also pay taxes. Looking around the courtyard of the Sherdor Madrasa, it becomes clear how much work is involved in restoring the tile ornamentation. Ashur is happy to make a small contribution through his rent and taxes. He was born in Samarkand and has stories for every corner of the city. None of the madrasas have high doors. That's not because the people were short, no. There were a few surahs, chapters from the Quran, above every door. Every student had to bow his head in honor when entering and leaving the madrasa. And that's the reason. In Uzbekistan, cleaning the streets is woman's work. Asking spontaneous questions is frowned upon. We have to convince our watchdog first. The Registan is the heart of Samarkand. What else can we say? We have to feed our children. That's life. Even though the authoritarian government won't admit it, international observers estimate that almost one in six people in Uzbekistan is unemployed. The minimum wage is roughly 40 euros per month. Spontaneously, even though it wasn't on the approved schedule, 
we are allowed to visit Aziz, a rug seller. The magnificent domed hall in the madrasa is a privileged setting for presenting these precious works. This size of carpet, it takes about four or five months. Usually two ladies working. The price depends on it is not how many knots per square centimeter. It takes more times to make more knots. <laughs> yes, it's possible to bargain. Yes, yes, it's possible to uh, sell it and uh, we will negotiate the price, no problem. Aziz invites us to visit the carpet factory on the outskirts of Samarkand. His family revived traditional silk carpet production there after the collapse of the Soviet Union. A machine is used to wind the silk thread onto reels. Junior manager Faridun tells us the silkworms are farmed in eastern Uzbekistan. To get one kilogram of thread, 12,000 silkworms have to die. This silk from Fergana Valley. In one month, we need about uh, the silk thread 50, 60 kilo. We use in one month. In 56 kilos, uh, we, we will be about five, four, five carpets. Even though Uzbekistan is a Muslim country, most women we see don't wear a headscarf and have painted fingernails. The machine is a well-oiled relic from the Soviet era. This machine we bought in 1990, about 25 years old. This from Russia, Russian machine. It's very good. Using 50-year-old mechanisms for spinning threads is high-tech compared to the dyeing process. Only the Afghan dye master knows how long walnut shells need to cook to get the desired colour. You can make hundreds of colours from walnut shells. The same is true with pomegranates and wild madder roots. After the walnut shells are removed, the silk thread is given its colour in a hot bath. The dye master tells us he comes from an ancient dynasty of dyers. He uses the peel of pomegranates to produce different shades of yellow. Reds come from the wild madder and anything from grey to dark brown comes from walnut shells. All these ingredients grow in the surrounding area. The only import is indigo to make blue. It comes from India. It takes great skill to reproduce popular colours consistently. To be on the safe side, he always dyes a little more silk so he doesn't run out of the colour he needs when he's only halfway through a rug. It's only after the dyed silk has dried that they can start knotting the rugs. It's largely young, mostly unmarried women who are working here. Even though it's piecework, the atmosphere seems relaxed. The women here earn good money by Uzbek standards, and yet many don't stay long. For many women, their professional lives end when they enter an arranged marriage. Up until now, We've only seen speedy fingers, but here's the Turkish knot step by step. Yak, do, se, chor, panch, shish, half. It's good job. We for ladies we we will pay per knot. In end of the month we will calculate it. And if we're taking salary in our workshop, if we're taking middle per month, uh, 150, 200 US dollars. But who making more not to get more money? How many knots can you do? Per minute, 45 knots. I am making maximum eight knots. Men haven't patience. In all handmade patient, it's very important. 
I can do it, but more than 10 minutes I cannot sit in here. In this way, if you saw all ladies working. A patronizing tone to our ears. During our travels, we have to keep reminding ourselves that values here are different. We've reached the Gisar Mountains, the highest mountain range in Uzbekistan. We now have two companions who politely tell us what we can and cannot do. The largest town in the region, Boysun, has a population of 27,000. We want to learn more about Kopkari, an ancient wild equestrian event. We see the first horse and ask to stop. The horse's owner, Shora, agrees to let us film. Shora enthusiastically shows us his Kopkari equipment. The bandage protects the legs. Protection's vital because Kopkari is a kind of rugby on horseback. The ball in this instance is a dead headless goat. The high leather boots protect the knees. The jacket is also padded. Apart from knocking a competitor off his horse, almost everything's allowed in Kopkari in order to gain and keep possession of the goat. I sometimes use this rope to keep the goat. Then I have my hands free. I tie the goat leg like this. And then the goat doesn't fall off. According to legend, even Genghis Khan's riders used Kopkari to train for war. Today, Kopkari is all about honor. Picking up the ulak from the ground and then galloping away. Shora makes it look easy. The one with the goat, who gets far enough away from the bulk of the players, wins the round. This extended family live off agriculture. Ah, yeah, it's just as. I settled here as a farmer in 1975. We now cultivate 615 hectares. Even the smallest are able to ride. The patriarch is proud of his family. I have eight grown children five daughters-in-law and, thanks be to God, ten grandchildren already. <laughs> Come in, this tea. This invitation isn't on our approved filming schedule for today. We enjoy the hospitality, sitting the traditional way with cross legs. There's bread and lamb. The women remain in the background. The topic of conversation? Naturally, it's Kopkari. Chora dreams of winning. Then we're allowed to admire the trophies he's already won. A lot of rugs, but not silk ones. The few high-end products made in Uzbekistan are largely exported. But that doesn't dampen this winner's pride. <laughs> the Kopkari takes place tomorrow, so we have time to visit the saddler in the neighboring village. This appointment has been announced and approved. The entire family has been cleaning up for us. It's a typical homestead with a house, a small plot of land, a workshop, and a shed. This is where we store the aspen wood. That's where we process it. Saddles made of wood. That's not unusual. Wooden saddles are the archetype. Such a saddle consists of 16 parts. These two parts belong in the front, here. These two are for the side. This is how the seat is attached. Thick padding is placed between the saddle and the horse's back. That has a major advantage. A saddle like this fits on any horse. 
animal tendons are hammered until they're soft. Then they're frayed and stuck to the light aspen wood with a special glue. That makes the saddle durable. It'll last for generations. We make the glue by boiling cut-up cow leather in water for a whole day. That's what we use for glue. The saddle maker helps his favorite grandson demonstrate the finished saddle. I just started school, but when I'm big, I want to be a saddler too, he says. The family makes around 60 saddles a year. Traditionally, a saddle costs one sheep. It would seem 60 sheep are enough to get through a year. Time for a farewell photograph before we head back to Boysoon. Like everywhere else in the country, they celebrate the Navroz festival here at the start of spring. The festival includes music, dancing and kopkari. Shura and his brothers are already here. A place of honour has been set up in the front row for the venerated elders. The horses are relaxed. Shora shows us his horse. The Kopkari match will start in an hour. The pitch is over there. There's hearty festival food here too, grilled shish kebabs. Another popular attraction at the Navroz festival is the wrestling matches. Young men compete at being the strongest. Women aren't accepted as spectators, things get rough. The wrestlers have to stay within the circle. And the spectators must remain outside. Crowd control is accomplished with the lash of a switch. There are big prizes for the winners, goats, for example. Kopkari riders can also win goats. The game starts. The referee arrives on a white steed, easily recognisable by his embroidered coat. Shora is also dressed up. Soviet army caps are popular with many of the riders as head protectors. The headless body of the goat is filled with salt and water and weighs almost 50 kilograms. Before the riders are let loose, they pray together. A false start. The man with the megaphone keeps the wild horde in check. The game begins. We struggle to make out the goat in among all the horses and riders. Suddenly, a rider has grabbed it. He's trying to get away from the pack. The spectators have to make sure they get out of the way. The first round has been decided. The referee passes a note with the name of this round's winner to the man with the megaphone. He calls out the name and the goat's body is returned to the starting position. And so it goes, round after round.
Chaboran is the next winner. A break between two rounds. Shoha comes over to us. He's not yet managed to lay hands on the goat's body, but he's still feeling positive and optimistic. Things are going quite well. With God's help, things will even get better. And then the winner of the round races right past us. That irritates Shaw. He says goodbye and throws himself back into the throng. A Kopkari match can last several hours, so we head on. Around 100 kilometers east in the steppes, surrounded by cows and tortoises, we meet with Professor Turgunov to travel back in time. <laughs> Bahudir Turgunov is an archaeologist. The bathroom tiles he's walking on are almost 2,000 years old. Paul. The floor here has been preserved. The owner wanted to create a vegetable patch, and in doing so, he discovered a tile. We stopped him and started digging. Little by little, we uncovered this bathroom. The wastewater ran through this pipe into a big ditch here. It must have been five or six meters deep. Professor Turgunov takes us on a walk along the town walls of the former border fort of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. The castle was back there. It was five hectares in size and the town was 42 hectares. The town walls were built between 100 and 300 BC. Sheep graze here now, but during the Kushan Empire, which extended from the Aral Sea to China and India, there was a city here. A villa is being excavated, strictly monitored by Japanese archaeologist Kato Kiyotsu. He's the most senior person on this dig. I am 93. 93, and he still personally oversees digs with colleagues like Turgunov. Uzbekistan has been his favourite spot since 1963. Experts tell us the two round stones supported columns that held up the roof of the hall, but the stones reveal even more than that. This stone shows that the people here had connections to Greece and Rome. It's the only way they were able to make such architectural elements. These stones also exist in Afghanistan, Pakistan and even India. In Central Asia, they occur here in southern Uzbekistan, in the Termez region. Only the very rich could afford this. The stones had to be transported 80 kilometers. We feel the fever of a treasure hunter every time the spade hits the ground. Did the owner possess anything valuable? A rich man, like his neighbors. Every house has 18 to 23 rooms. In one of them, I found a pot containing a gold treasure weighing 36 kilograms. Clay shards are everyday discoveries. Finding a treasure is a sensation. Today is one such occasion. We've brought them good luck, a 2,000-year-old bronze sculpture. Nice colours, green. This is the head. This is the lion and this is the stag. This seems to be a lamp. A chirac. It's an old lamp to illuminate a room. Lamp, lamp. 
we leave the excavation site and head 300 kilometers north to the city of Shari Sabs. It's famous for the ruins of a huge palace, the Ak Sarai. Amir Timur, or Tamerlane, was born in Shari Sabs in 1336. An unscrupulous conqueror, he created one of the largest but also shortest lived empires in Central Asia in the 14th century. He ordered the construction of Aksarai Palace in 1380. Today, he's celebrated as a folk hero. The architect, Aziz, invites us to a party. It's Timur's birthday. We're making plov in his honor. We always do that. The women make plov for everyone working at the Aksarai. Our plov is very tasty. Like pilaf, it's a rice and meat dish, in this case with yellow turnips. Plov is the national dish of Uzbekistan. First, however, the oven is heated to bake a special bread. We call this bread is. It scares away evil spirits. When you have some, the evil spirits disappear from your life. Aziz makes his living as a restorer and architect. Almost everything he does is associated with the palace ruin. He buys and sells paintings that depict motifs from Timur's time. He's not the only one fascinated by the ruin. All that remains are the side columns of the main entrance. Aziz invites us to climb onto the gate to get a better impression of the huge dimensions. The gate is 50 metres wide. Covered by a dome, it was 70 metres high, more than 20 modern-day storeys. The palace covered almost the entire area. It's due to be transformed into a park. The entire palace was 300 meters long. Where you can now see the statue, and that's where the hall with a dome was located, where Timur held meetings. There were a thousand rooms and each one was decorated in its own way with gemstones. No two were alike. Symbols of power. But even the park that the government is planning, and for which homes have to make way, seems intimidating. On the other hand, the colours of the 600-year-old tile facades are comforting. Aziz is very knowledgeable about the motifs of the Aksarai. He works almost fanatically on one model, even copying the tiles. This is only the beginning. When the model's done, everything will be painted in the right colours, and the tiles will be to scale. I'll build the minaret like this. Then I'll attach it to the base. If I could, I'd instantly travel back in time. At least for five minutes, with a camera. To take a look around and remember it. I'd love that. Timur allegedly said, if you doubt my power, look at my buildings. Aksarai still has a captivating power, even as a ruin. 
Uzbekistan's capital, Tashkent, was largely destroyed by an earthquake in 1966. Today, modern glass palaces stand beside Soviet architecture. Few ancient buildings survive. There are many monuments, such as the Mother of Uzbekistan, which is intended to demonstrate the unity of the young state. Tashkent has a population of more than two million. We meet Delia at the bazaar. She's studying German language and literature. Even in the city, most people buy what they need for everyday life at the bazaar. The choice is both colourful and rich. People go to the market so they can try everything and then barter. We really want to try plof. Delia helps us buy all the ingredients such as meat and carrots. She asks for half a kilogram of yellow and orange carrots. They're available pre-chopped at the bazaar. Anyone who thinks all rice is the same should visit a bazaar. There are countless varieties here. Rice is also grown in Uzbekistan. This is the best rice from the Horezem region. It is called Lazar. It makes the plov taste better than other types of rice. Our watchdogs forbid us from going home with Delia to make plov. We understand why the organization Reporters Without Borders ranks Uzbekistan 166th out of 180 with regard to press freedom. There's no such thing here. We negotiate an alternative filming location to make the plof. A special kitchen, the plof centrale, that cooks for up to 4,000 people every day. The quantities poured into the four huge pots are correspondingly large. Here too, in the middle of the city, the plof is cooked on an open fire. The Uzbeks are firm about that. It's the only way the food tastes right. The meat cooks under the rice until everything is ready. We spot the yellow carrots from the market. The head chef is nice enough to give us the recipe. We always adjust our quantities to how many guests we have. We have many guests today. That's why we're using 50 kilograms of rice, 50 kilograms of carrots, 50 kilograms of meat, oil, spices and pepper. The meat and vegetables are seasoned and fried in oil. Then they're covered in rice and it's all cooked for a while. People can order quail or chicken eggs on the side. The meat's chopped up and served on top. People in Uzbekistan generally pay cash. Credit cards are rare. 3,000 Uzbek som corresponds to roughly one euro. One portion of plof costs between three and four euros. The dining hall is a mix of modern features, plush seating and plastic tablecloths. That's quite typical for a Tashkent restaurant. The old town of Bukhara, 500 kilometers west of Tashkent, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Kalon Minaret dates back to the 13th century. Bukhara is famous for its shady domed bazaars. They sell souvenirs, crafts and traditional art, such as miniature paintings. The Islamic art form developed from illuminated manuscripts, particularly during the 13th century. The traditional arts are heavily subsidized through tax breaks by the Uzbek government. The quality of its traditional arts is known around the world. Whoa. 
Outside of the centre, in a small alleyway where we're not supposed to film, we meet another master craftsman, Toshev Rachmon. He's just on his way home to his workshop. He's carrying a bale of cotton under his arm. It's the canvas for his art, Suzani embroidery. The name Suzani comes from the Persian word for needle. For centuries now, it's been the hallmark of high-quality silk embroidery from Central Asia. Toshev's son also works here. Every pattern has symbolic meaning. This pattern's called Islimi. The intertwined branches are a symbol of the eternal nature of life. This is my son, Raphael. He's just graduated from art college. Toshev uses only silk that's been coloured using natural dyes from Uzbekistan. He owes it to his grandmother that he's turned into a patient craftsman. If my grandmother had told me I couldn't do this, I wouldn't have carried on. Instead, she always said I had done a nice job and that if I carried on in the way she showed me, it would get even better. That's where I got my love of this work from. It comes from the heart. We'd like to stay and enjoy the tranquility of the artist's studio, but we have to leave Bukhara and continue our journey along the Silk Road towards Kiva. The 400-kilometre journey between the two oases runs through the Kuzulkum Desert. It covers around four-tenths of Uzbekistan. The Amu River is just a trickle by the time it reaches Kiva. It won't get all the way to the Sea of Aral. Too much water is removed from the river via canals to irrigate rice and cotton fields. High levels of evaporation on the fields also lead to so much salinization that the salt is visible here as white marks. This is also where the pesticide residue builds up until nothing grows anymore. The magnificence of Kiva stands in stark contrast. The old town is almost wholly preserved with many monuments in a small area surrounded by a city wall. Camel owners once guided their caravans here. Now it's tourists who are guided along the route. The most striking building is the short minaret, the Kalta Minor. It was supposed to be the largest minaret near or far, but it was never finished after the Khan's death in 1855. Sinab's house is very close to the Kalta Minor. Because more and more tourists were coming, the enterprising businesswoman turned her living room into a restaurant. That gave me the idea of providing services to tourists. I could provide food in this small room and house them in two others. That's how we opened this hotel. It all started in this basic kitchen. On some days, we cooked for a hundred people, but we managed. Before the tourists go to Sinab, they have a whole city full of attractions to see. One of them is the Juma Mosque, which looks inconspicuous from the outside, but its prayer room is quite unique. Two hundred and twelve columns from seven centuries support the wooden ceiling. Right next to the mosque, young men learn the ancient art of woodworking from master craftsmen, thereby keeping the craft alive. Practically anyone who comes to Uzbekistan buys wood carvings from Kiva. It 
Sina proudly shows us what she's built opposite her family home. Her own tea house, in which she can serve many more guests than in her home with the old kitchen. She even has some employees now. The boss is doing an inspection. She's strict with her staff. Something seems to have been neglected there. A large group from France is booked in for this evening. Everything has to be in order. Soup's already simmering in the new kitchen. Sainab explains that the longer the soup simmers, the better it tastes. This soup contains meat, carrots, potatoes, onions and tomatoes. Let's try it. It's always good to see it, but better to taste it. Sainab's whole business is based on visitors. That idea has a long-standing tradition in Kiva on the Silk Road. People from lots of different countries, such as Spain, Italy, Germany, Japan and France, come here. They come through here like a caravan. What can I say? Our caravan must depart for home. One last look at Kiva's old town and its palaces, a world cultural heritage site. We've been deeply impressed by Uzbekistan and its many friendly people. We weren't able to move around freely though, so just to be sure, we copied our footage three times before leaving and hid it in our suitcase under our dirty socks. You never know. <laughs>